And they said, these guys can go into the Army, these guys can go in the Army and the Navy, and you six include this fellow right to my right, and I can go into the Marine Corps. Well, my ego went through the ceiling, and I said, well, I, I can't refuse a deal like that. I'm going to the Marine Corps. And I was never sorry. Very good. John, why did you go in the Marine Corps? Why did you choose the Marine Corps? Did you have a choice? Hold the mic close to your mouth, please. I had a brother that was in the Marine Corps in a year and a half over and I was in the second division. But, uh, oh, I don't really know. I had a, I had a draft board. I had a farm department. I lived on a farm. I had a farm department. And one day somebody started raising up waving a flag in front of me. And I told the neighbor that I, the neighbor man that I was working for, I said, it's at lunch. I said, I'm going up to the draft board and wave my department. And going to the Marine Corps, getting the Marine Corps with my brother. Anyhow, I went up to the draft board, and the next day I was down in St. Louis. Didn't get to the Marine Corps that day because I happened to have the wrong paper, so I have to go back down to my hometown and pick up the right paper. So the next day I'm back down in St. Louis again, and then I'm in the Marine Corps. And then about two weeks later, I was sorry. <laughs> One happy went in the Corps and one sorry you went in the Corps. <laughs> Colonel, what about you going in the Marine Corps? I don't know whether the same crowd here was here yesterday. I'll try to remember what answer I gave them. <laughs> they, uh, okay. Yesterday the mic was squealing, so I had it too far away. Uh, I wanted to fly airplanes, and they told me if I got in the Marine Corps, I could fly them. Recruiting officer said once you finish boot camp, they'll send you over to San Diego, North Island, Naval Air Station, to make a pilot out of you. Uh, my DI didn't didn't exactly understand that. I got out of the his office just ahead of his toe. Uh, finally, eight years later, after World War II, uh, they wrote flight orders for me, so I got to fly for 22 years. But, uh, that was my reason, really, for going in the Marine Corps. Ralph, then why did you go in? I enlisted in 1943, 17, and it was given about the end of the war, or the middle of it, and the draft was fixed. It needed everybody they could get. So, it was my choice either to join the Marine Corps or Navy or be drafted. And in the Army, they're taking everybody but one armed men. So <laughs> I just flipped a coin, went to the Marine Corps, and I was lucky to get there. Ralph, do you have a nickname? <laughs> okay, why do they call you Pee Wee? Well, <laughs> they're Duncan. <laughs> Duncan here, there are three men in a fire team. Jesse Bogright, a corporal, he was 6'3". Mel Duncan down at the end was my bar, or our bar man, B-A-R, you know, and he was about 6'2". And I was in the middle, 5'6". <laughs> so, for about three months, he used to carry a stool around just to make me even when we took pictures. <laughs> They quit that after a while. They got old and tired. Did you even weigh enough when you went in the Marine Corps? <laughs> Did you weigh enough? <coughs> I went in. I, I never... I weighed 108 pounds when I enlisted. <laughs> and when I went up, it wouldn't take me. I had to weigh 112. <laughs> so, we lived right next street, right next to a Pius Street market, a farmer's market, that brought all their goods in. And the doctor told me, if you eat bananas, you'll gain a lot of weight. We didn't steal a pound of bananas, we stole the stock. <laughs> and we ate them. We ate them for 30 days. We went back up. I got on a scale and he says, you didn't follow the orders to begin with. You don't weigh enough. I said, Doc, I, weigh, I ate 30 pounds of potato, tomato, or bananas. And uh, he says, you sure you did? I said, yeah. He says, okay, 115. <laughs> 
Very good. The story about bananas. You, sir. Thank you. Uh, I was, wasn't old enough to join services at the beginning of the war either. And they stopped volunteering and uh, they wanted to draft you, put you where they wanted you. I went down to the draft board, asked them when they was going to call me. And uh, they said, well, when your name comes up. I said, well, I'm going to go. They said, your name will come up next week. <laughs> so I, I went, I got the draft, I went in, and uh, you could request a branch of service. And I had this good friend of mine that had already been in service come in, home on leave in his Marine uniform and everything. And when and we would get together and go out while he was home on liberty, girls wouldn't pay no attention to me. They wanted that Marine with that fancy uniform. <laughs> So I volunteer for the Marine. <laughs> so he went in because of the beautiful Marine Corps uniform. Yeah. Melvin, why'd you go in the Marine Corps? I thought those girls liked that blue uniform as well as I thought it looked. And uh, I thought I was tough enough, but before I got through boot camp, I began to wonder. But I have been sorry uh, that I did since. Very good. Next question I want to direct towards the Colonel. Colonel, can you tell us why this little tiny island was so important? Why the tiny island in the Pacific was so important for us? Probably some of you read an article here in a magazine a few months ago saying that uh, Iwo Jima was not important. Iwo Jima was located 700 miles north of uh, the island of Saipan and Tinian, where the B-29s were located. It was uh, about 700 miles south of Japan, so it was a trip of 1,400 miles with the B-29s in one direction, 2,800 miles round trip, but that uh, we figured out. The B 29s had a listed range of a little over 3,000 miles, so they didn't have too much uh, leeway. They got a heavy wind coming back. Uh, some of them didn't make it to like that. Iwo Jima had uh, Japanese radar notifying the main island that the planes were coming. Iwo Jima had uh, zero fighters intercepted the B-29. Once the B-29s got to Japan, uh, they ran into the fighters of the local defense. Then they dropped their bombs. They had to come back by that time. The Japanese, I keep wanting to say make, but they're zeros. Uh, the zeros on uh, Iwo Jima had been rearmed, and refueled, and came up to get them camp. So the, the attrition of B-29s was terrific, uh, unacceptable. Once Iwo Jima was captured, we not only had one airport there, they built another one. I think they eventually had three. They could bring in the P-51 fighter planes that could accompany the P-29s all the way to Japan. And uh, of course, combat with the Japanese fighters. One additional factor was that the radar was eliminated from Iwo Jima. And they also put air sea rescue planes on Iwo Jima so that the plane didn't quite make it back as far as the island. Went down to drink, I had somebody to pick them up. Before that, uh, they were lucky if there was a submarine around to pick up the crew. First airplane, the first B-29, landed on Iwo during the battle on the 4th of March. Between the 4th of March and the middle of August when the war ended, 2,200 B-29s landed on Iwo. That's a crew of about 24,000 men that could have gone down in the green. The, uh, that's basically the, the reason for taking Iwo Jima. Uh, 